Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Rider Rumblings video podcast. As always, I am joined by uh, my worthy constituent, Dr. Murray McCormick, okay. and um, we're very pleased and honoured to have with us today the Saskatchewan Rough Riders President CEO, uh, Craig Reynolds. Uh, Craig, thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, guys. I always, uh, you know, I always enjoy this. Well, you we look forward hope, to hope it. You're staying, hope you're saying that at the end of the podcast as well. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots of really, uh, we've got quite an interrogation for you here, and and uh, and uh, most of them are serious. So <laughs> well, <that laughs> we'll see how it goes. You know, I was, I was, I checked, Murray, I apologize, I didn't have this on the list of questions. I'm already meandering, but it occurred to me earlier today that uh, I, was, I was trying to think. Okay, it's a home playoff game. That's this is a big deal, and it, it occurred to me from the between the ages in my life of 13 and 42, there was one Saskatchewan Rough Riders playoff game when I was 24. There was one when I was 12. There was one when I was 43. The only one within those uh, uh, parameters was, was 1988 when I was 24 years old. So maybe we're a little spoiled because this is the third straight year with one and the fourth straight year with a playoff game period. But uh, um, it just struck me that these aren't, these are things to be celebrated, even if it's become uh, an annual thing, which I think is in line with your sustained uh, advocacy of sustained sustained success. But they're never guaranteed, and they're something to be appreciated. Uh, does that resonate with you at all, Craig, or am I just babbling already? No, no, it resonates a lot. Uh, like I, I grew up that time frame as well, right? So from 1988, I would have been 13, and I and I vaguely remember that game. And then there was another game till what was it, two, 2007? Yeah. It was, it was just an <laughs> incredible gap there. So by that time, I'd already welcomed my my uh, my daughter into the world. So, you know, that that's a that's a big, big gap of time. And and yeah, we're, we're really excited about about hosting the home playoff game, but it, it's hard to do. It really is like the West Division is a very tough division and you have to win a lot of football games and have some things go your way to host it. And to host it three three years in a row is 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 really good and, and full credit to Jeremy and, and Craig for the work they've done this year, um, especially with some of the challenges that we had had this year. So so I, I definitely think it's an accomplishment. It's really really good and important for the team. Uh, we have a distinct home field advantage here. So so yeah, it's something to be celebrated. I would I would agree with you there. I have to admit, Craig, it feels almost that long since the last playoff game in Riderville. <laughs> it's just that. We've been waiting from COVID and all the ups and downs and the downs and ups and things. I don't know how how have you been doing waiting this long, two nearly two years for a playoff game. It's funny. I was thinking about that driving the other day, Murray. Um, you know, I, I took myself back to even the start before um, the start of this season, and when we weren't sure we were going to even be able to play in 2021. And I took myself back to that, and if I would have told myself, "Hey, not only going to play, a, you know, a short and condensed season here." But you're going to host a home a home playoff game, and then on top of that, because I knew if we were going to play a season, it was going to be a little delayed, and it's going to be like plus seven or plus eight, whatever it's going to be on Sunday. I would have I would have taken that in a, in a heartbeat. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 meaningful. Um, it's been a lot of hard work by a lot of uh, people to get here, and it wasn't without its challenges, right? COVID is still uh, uh, you know something to be reckoned with, and and we've seen issues in 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 our league, and we've seen issues in others sports leagues with with COVID and so full credit that we're here um and that we're able to to play on Sunday at, at home in front of our crowd and 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 have a chance to compete for the great cup Craig Can I went I on just... the weather network and I looked it up and and uh, the forecast we're recording this on on mid-afternoon to Tuesday and the forecast for Sunday is eight degrees and not a lot of wind the forecast for Sunday in Foam Lake Saskatchewan your hometown is plus two uh <laughs> What's up in Foam Lake? Do they is is there, is there already 48 feet of snow or what's going on here? You know, it's interesting, Rob, because I, you know, I, especially in the summer, I, I look at that that temperature quite a quite a bit, and I will in the winter too. Um, and it's always colder in Foam Lake than it is in Regina, <laughs> and it's like two hours. It's not even two hours north. It's like you know, it's sort of an hour hour north ish, and but it's always colder. So I don't know what it what it is. Um, and my uh, my folks live at, at at the lake, so it's always a little chilly with the water or the wind coming off the, off the water as well. And now, obviously now it's frozen, frozen over, but yeah, it's always a little cold in foam. Like I, I don't know why. Do you, I mean, 
the weather's precarious. It can be even precarious in October in this city. I remember the, the coldest Ryder game I remember going to was on October 23rd, I think, in 91 against BC. And I went into the uh, bathroom at halftime in the upper deck, and it was like a convention in there because it was so warm in that bathroom. I just froze. And the Riders lost 36 to 5 to BC that day, and John Volpe went crazy. And um, and that's, that's not even November. Uh, when the schedule comes out, and obviously you aspire to have a uh, play a home home playoff game on November 28th, ideally December 5th. But when you look at that and you remember how cold it was for most of the week in 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 uh, in, in 2013, um, of the football gods and things could change. But have they really smiled upon you? Could you have imagined that you'd be looking at the weather forecast on a Tuesday of the week of a home playoff game that's scheduled for November 28th and seeing eight without a minus before it? No, I, I, I couldn't have imagined that because, you know, you're right. When you look at the schedule and obviously our goal is to host, host our own playoff game. So that could have been the 28th or could have been December 5th. Um, and you think about how cold it can be. And I remember the 2013 Grey Cup that whole week. And so you, you sort of mentally prepare yourself that it could be really, really cold. In Saskatchewan at the end of November, early December, it could be really, really cold. And so as soon as the long range of the veil, I started looking looking at it. And it was even early on, it sort of said it was going to be minus two or I forget what it was, minus four the first time I got a glimpse. And I said, you know, that that's okay. We can we can deal with that. And then every day since I've looked, and it's just gotten warmer and warmer and warmer. And and I, I looked earlier and it was seven. And if you tell me it's it's, it's up to eight now, that, that's just fantastic, you know, to have a, a game in the November in, in Regina and have it to be in, in the plus temperature, that, that's a win. Craig, there's something wrong with your mic. Is there? Things, yeah, it's breaking up. Oh, sorry. No, it sounds um, clear. That sounds clear. Yeah. That's better. Okay. That's better, yeah. I guess Murray you and I are the ones who are supposed to sound garbled. So. <laughs> I'll just that's that. better. That's no better. Sorry about, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> the technical <laughs> difficulties were temporary. Um, uh, Craig, just I, Rob and I are bouncing back and forth. We're going to interrupt each other and step all each other's toes for this, as you probably realize. How are tickets tracking for the game with this great weather, great matchup, everything looking great? How are tickets tracking? Well, there's there's still good tickets available, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, what what happens tend to happen um, as, a, you know, in these later games of the season is it's totally weather dependent. So when we had that big snowstorm, we were tracking quite well um, and we were able to sort of start selling tickets a couple weeks in advance. And we were sell, selling several hundred a day, which is, which is good at that stage. And then we had that big blizzard and it just stop um and that's that tends to happen and so it's picked up a fair bit uh, i think as people sort of have, have come around to the to the fact it's going to be really really nice on sunday so uh you know we're hitting pretty hard with with trying to encourage people to get out i know our players are, are encouraging fans to fans to come out and so so we're hopeful we're hopeful we have a a, a big crowd um and and uh, you know weather is a big issue this time of year so if, if you remove that variable that gives us a, gives us a chance i had some people think sorry rob just thought it was kind of presumptuous of the riders to start selling playoff tickets before they had that home playoff game locked up. But that's that's pretty normal normal that's, business properties, isn't, yeah. operations, isn't it? That's pretty standard. Actually, we, we waited probably longer than we have in the, in, in the past, but that's pretty standard. When you've got a chance to host a home playoff game, um, you tend to go, go to go to market with it because um, the last thing you want to do is have a really, really short selling window. Um, and obviously, there's always, you know, if we, if we weren't, to, weren't to host it, we would be refunding those, those tickets. But, yeah, the, the biggest challenge is, is having only a week to, to try to sell out, sell out a stadium. That's a challenge. In a year when you've, well, I guess over a two-year period, when you face so many financial challenges, how nice is it, how important is it to get a home playoff game this year to perhaps defray some of the uh, financial hardship that uh, you would, uh, you're not out of the woods as a result of it, but it sure is nice to have that in the comeback season. I would, I would guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it's a big thing. It really is. It's a big thing for our team. As I mentioned, it, I, I think it gives us an advantage at, at home and, and, the, and the crowd and, and the energy that the crowd brings is, is an advantage in, in a West semifinal. And then financially it's, it's important. Um, you know, it, it's, it, especially this year. So um, it's just another, Sort of tick that that helps on the on the business recovery and and um, you know when we uh, had the uh, interception uh, when Deerboard had that had that tick I sort of had a, a number in my mind on on financially what that that interception to seal the West Semi uh, did for the club so it was a it was a very uh, profitable interception I would say that 
Don't let his agent know about that. You <laughs> might <laughs> that might comp, comp, complicate negotiations for Jo if he wants a cut. Yeah, exactly. So I'll I'll just keep that to myself. But I mean, it's it's sometimes I've I've heard home playoff games described occasionally as million dollar games. Are we talking something in that vicinity optimally? Yeah, no, not not quite that amount. So obviously the cost base has increased a, a, a fair bit. So I would say years ago um, that number was was fairly accurate. Um, I think in 2018 the net uh, profit on the playoff game was somewhere, and and I use 2018 as an example because it was also West Emmy was somewhere in the range of six hundred thousand dollars. So so that would be you know our hope that we would get somewhere um, towards that this year, which which would really help because you know we've had some uh, you know the business has has rebounded in some in some areas but like you said rob we're not out of the woods yet um, we're still going to see the lingering impact impacts of covid financially into next year but it's um it's it certainly it certainly helps the financial picture to have the potential to have another 500 600 thousand dollars come come to the club from hosting the game well rob and i were bantering this back and forth because we want to have a little fun what are you do about that end zone those goal, goal posts in the north end zone, you got any plans for those to get those you out talk, of the way? Talk to Everaz about something, sanding them down. Is there something that yeah. can be done? Is Tim, Tim, Tim Reed going to get involved here? No, I don't even know if we need need them. Let's be honest. Like, let's just, let's just if, if, if he's going <laughs> to kick a field goal, let's let's kick it to the south. We'll just flip the field briefly <laughs> and, and get yeah. there. So, no, let's hope those don't come into play. That would be, uh, but you know what? That's, uh, you know, when you, you talked about Murray, that was the last time we went to a playoff game, obviously. And, and I yeah. just remember the feeling, the empty feeling when, oh. when you heard that, that, that ball go off that, that goalpost. So let's, let's hope we don't have that kind of, kind of ending. Um, but I know the guys are excited to sort of exercise those demons, if you will. Yeah. Is there a witch doctor that you can uh, hire? Is there, is there, is there, <laughs> yeah, we, is there we, some we, kind we of voodoo that you can use? So yeah, no, it, it, I'll tell you that was uh, that was something, and that was an only in the CFL moment too, right? Uh, yeah. Only in the CFL are you going to see uh, a ball bounce off the uprights, and and I always go back to wondering uh, would that ball have, have been completed um, if that upright wasn't there? I know for me, play time and time and time again, and I still can't figure out if Kyran Moore was open enough to get it. You just don't know. Like it looked like he had about a half step but the DB has a chance to maybe dump, jump the route. But you just you just wonder. It's like the movie that just gets edited right before the climactic scene. is like, and I guess uh, the sequel uh, well, is, is on Sunday, but it's it's like, my goodness, like what a cliffhanger. You just don't know. You'll always wonder. Same thing happened in, in 65. The riders were in, uh, in Winnipeg in a West semifinal, and Ronnie – near the end of the game was looking for Jim Warden in the end zone, bang off the, uh, off the upright. And it was debatable then was Jim Warden open riders ended up uh, losing 15 to nine in that game. But the next time they were in the playoffs, they won the great cup. So maybe this is a good omen for you. Yeah, yeah I know about you, Craig. I still remember Cody Fajardo being flat on the ground after that yeah. one and seeing everything he'd done for that team all whole year. And to see that reaction was just like heartbreaking. Silly. Yeah. <laughs> It's those those types of moments you'll you'll never forget, right? Um, never forget some of the really really great moments, but you'll never forget some of the heartbreaking moments. And that was a bit of a heartbreaking moment because we don't, you know, as much as you know, we posted three straight um, home playoff games. West Finals, to your point earlier, Rob, don't don't come along all that often too. And so to be that close to potentially punching your ticket to the the Grey Cup and 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 having that uh, that goalpost coming the way, yeah, I'll never forget that moment, unfortunately. But Cody is healthy this year. I mean, as healthy as a quarterback can be after the rigors of a regular season, but there was all the drama leading up to the West final in 2019 about would he play? Would he be able to play? Uh, what percentage would he be? At? He ended up performing amazingly considering the uh, physical limitations that he had, not just with the torn obliques, but it turns out he was a walking bruise and a walking muscle pull. And to have a healthy Cody going into the playoffs, I just wonder what kind of X factor that is. Yeah, no, it's exciting. And, and you know, that was the benefit of clinching the, the week earlier was we were able to rest a few guys, Cody, Cody included. And, and, and that's important. Um, you know, this time of year, everybody is is whether they're injured or they're, or they're hurt. They're, they're not at 100 um, percent. And so to be able to rest Cody, to be able to rest Dan Clark, who had, you know, the, the ankle injury earlier. Those are those are important things. And so so that's um, hopefully uh, we see the benefits of that um, come Sunday. Murphy, I'm kind of curious, and this is another question I didn't have, Rob, out there. You show a lot of 
information about the team. Do you follow the team as a business proposition or are you still a fan where you still can get there behind it? What Cody Fajardo is doing still, is there still that kind of love and passion for football to, for you? Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm a fan at heart and, um, and, you know, I grew up loving, loving the team. You know, I don't have the encyclopedia of, of games like, like Rob, Rob does, but I no remember does. certain, I know nobody does. Absolutely. But I remember <laughs> certain moments and I remember where I was for, for so many games. You know, I, I remember the 89, uh, the kick exactly where I was in my parents' basement. They had a big party in Foam Lake. And, and I just, I grew up loving this, this football team. So, so I'm still a fan. Um, and, you know, Thankfully and, and luckily, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to sort of debrief games with with Jeremy O'Day and sometimes Craig <laughs> Dickinson. So, so you know, sometimes I got to pinch myself. The the fan part of me uh, pinches pinches myself, but you know, you have a job to do too. And so there's the business side of it as as well. And you're the CEO, and you've got uh, certain responsibilities. And so you you have to kind of take your fan hat off sometimes and think about it from a from a business perspective. And so 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 it's interesting on the on the on the uh, you know hosting and playoff game is a good example because exactly when and Jay Dearborn had that interception. I immediately thought of the financial impact to the club, how important that was. <laughs> yeah. The fan in me also was like, "Holy cow, we're going to host the, the the West Semi, and, and that gives us an advantage." And and um and then we get the rest guys, and you know all the, all the other things. So so it's interesting. You kind of you kind of ebb ebb and flow a little bit uh, with your fan hat on, and then and then my my CEO proper hat hat on. One thing that intrigues me is, and we've seen Bo Levi Mitchell come into Mosaic Stadium numerous times. We've never seen it in the playoffs coming in here. I mean, he played, I think, five five plays against the Rough Riders in the 2013 West Final. Uh, that's the extent of his playoff experience against the Rough Riders, as accomplished as he is and as familiar as he is to Rough Rider fans. I'm really intrigued by what his presence will do for the vibe at uh, Mosaic Stadium. And it's a short week, or there's, there's even if there's a, there's a lot of time left this week before Sunday. You just wonder... Given his nature, is there going to be a bulletin board type statement or something that's really going to fire it up? And I'm also wondering, we always had the Henry chat when Henry Burris came in with Calgary. Is this going to be sort of an equivalent personality once uh, Bo Levi gets here? What do you think he is going to add to this, the, the whole uh, mystique of the event, the whole well, vibe? I, I, yeah, I think I think you hit on it a little bit. There, there are certain players that, that Ryder fans sort of lo- love to hate, if you will, and 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 Henry uh, was was one of those those, and you know it, it added to the intrigue and in, in the um, the 2013 Grey Cup, just having Henry in in the Grey Cup. And you know Calgary doesn't go on the road very often in in the playoffs, so so I'm in, I'm as intrigued as you are to sort of see um, how they how they respond and um, you know in an away playoff game and how our fans re- respond. And you know Calgary that rivalry um, is such a good one, and it's been like that that for for years. Um, and you think about 2009 when we clinched, you know, the, um, the, the ticket to, to the Grey Cup and, and, and beat, beat Calgary at, at, at home in, in Mosaic. So we've had some great playoff battles with, with, with Calgary, again, going into their house in 2013 to win that game, to come back to, to Regina and play, uh, play the, the Grey Cup in front of our fans. So, so yeah, we have great, um, and, and the games this year, they're all so, so close. So it's just a great rivalry, and I'm really looking forward to to the game. Is that the best rivalry? Is that the best rivalry right now between the Riders and the Stamps? Yeah, I think so. Really I think it's close. You know, I think I think the Bombers, you know, we have a really good rivalry with the Bombers too. Um, you know, that Labor Day and that Labor Day rematch, those games, those 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 mean a lot. Um, and you know, we we hope we're successful on Sunday and get to to uh to have another kick at that um in, in IG Field in in 2 weeks, but but yeah, that Calgary Saskatchewan rivalry, and it's you know there's other additional intrigue. You got the brothers coaching each other, and and I was so happy for Craig when when he finally beat that because I can't imagine going home every year and having those yeah. conversations and having <laughs> never be, never beat your brother. So so hopefully uh, he gets another one on Sunday, and and uh, can uh, when he goes home for Christmas uh, he can he can uh, walk in proudly into his parents' house. Well, I'm a I'm a wrestling fan, and and so you always look at it and think, where's the villain? And it seems to me as, as, as intense as the Rough Rider Bombers rivalry has been over the years. Uh, I mean, once upon a time, Troy Westwood was sort of the central figure and the villain there. There really isn't a villainous character on the Blue Bombers right now. Whereas you look at Calgary and there is Bo Levi Mitchell, who can just be such a center of attention for so many reasons. It, it seems like you need the, uh, and I'm not casting aspersions on any personalities here, but it seems like you need the heel uh, in order yeah. to really get the fans fired up. 
Um, but yeah, no, I think, uh, like I said before, I think he's, he's just that, you know, he's been so good for so, for so long and, you know, our, our fans as a result of sort of, um, you know, lo- you know, yeah, he's one of those characters you, you love, you love to hate. And, and so, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's kind of been, been the villain. We've got to take a break here because I am mandated to do so by my bosses. So this is a, uh, we, uh, this is the, uh, select break. We bring in the Zamboni and then we resume the podcast. So, uh, We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Actually, we'll be right back a lot sooner than that. We just need to build in the break. <laughs> <laughs> We're back on the Rider Rumblings podcast. I'm here with Marie McCormick and with uh, the Saskatchewan Fighters President, CEO, uh, Craig Reynolds, who has kindly consented to endure more of our, our questions here. Um, I'm just curious, and this is the, this is the old person in me. Um, the game's being played on Sunday on November 28th, an infamous day in Rough Rider history. That was the day in 1976 when Tony Gabriel caught that pass. Um, and you, we, we've talked about it a bit earlier with, you know, with your own personal history following the Rough Riders. For somebody who wasn't, um, well, you were one year old when he caught that pass. Do you, do pe- people of your generation, do they have an appreciation for the impact? You know, I, I wonder sometimes, like, there's a, there's a whole generation of, of hockey fans, or there's a, I mean, a lot more hockey fans didn't see the Paul Henderson goal than uh, compared to those who, who did. But I think, you know, they still understand what the Paul Henderson goal meant. Um, the Tony Gabriel catch 45 years ago on Sunday, th- does that uh, bring a empty feeling to your stomach, even though you were one year old and I presume not particularly aware of what was going on at the time? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, if you're a Ryder fan, you appreciate the history of, of, of the club. And I, and I was always struck by the fact that we had really, we've only won four great cups in our entire history. And then you go back and you, you see the number of great cups we competed in and, 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 and lost. And so, so it's, it's, it's just an unfortunate part of the history. So the team was so good for so long, but just could not consistently win, win the big game. And, and I think that moment in particular is sort of epitomizes uh, that and so so yeah i think i think if you appreciate uh the, the rough riders and, and appreciate our history that's a, that's an that's an, a a moment that um you know is kind of reflective of some of the challenges uh when you had such a good team but just were not able to consistently win win that great cup i've looked at it though you know i think you almost need those moments not that you invite them but in order to fully appreciate what a great cup championship means in this market uh, you have to look at the other end of the spectrum and realize what has been painful. And, you know, I was at the Grey Cup in Toronto in 1989, just sitting up in the stands. And I was also at the Tony Gabriel game when I was 12. So two different games in Toronto, uh, a 12-year-old me and a 25-year-old me. And, um, I mean, obviously everybody went nuts when Dave Ridgway kicked that field goal. But having known what it's like at the other end of the spectrum, you look at the 13th man in 2009, and could juxtapose that with what it felt like four years later to win. It was very sweet to win at home, but four years after being at the other end of the spectrum, I think it made it even sweeter. There have only been four championships, but I don't think anybody's ever celebrated championships better because they know they don't come along very, very often. And they know that uh, the people know that they've, they've, you know, they've dealt with the other end emotion wise. And I think, for example, with the, with the Cody Fajardo play to, in the upright to conclude the uh, West final in 2019, the next time the Rockwars win a Grey Cup, people are going to think they're going to be able to contrast that to something and uh, appreciate it more. Am I just babbling or is there merit? You're doing a good job of babbling, Rob, I have to admit. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to throw it there. As a lifelong Tiger Cats fan, Tony Champion's catch was still one of the best catches I've seen in a heartbreaking Grey Cup. So if we can just bring that up, I don't mean to do that. But anyway, Rob, I just wonder, Craig, maybe just talk, and let's get a little bit of seriousness, a little bit talk about the I did ask topic. a question, Murr. Did you? I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what was it? Sorry, do need, Rob. Do you need those bitter moments in order to fully oh, appreciate sorry. the, uh, you know, in order to fully appreciate a sweet moment? Yeah, I, I, th- I think it I think it helps because you're exactly right. Like, I, you know, obviously worked for the club in 2009, and again, moments you'll never forget. I, I know exactly where I was when that, you know, penalty was was called. So you absolutely in 2013 when I was on the field celebrating that win, you go back right to that that moment where you know how heartbroken you were to have that. And and the guys consistently talk about the 2019 West final and the heartbreak of of not winning that game and the way we lost and 
and the, you know, that was all they thought about. And I think, you know, we did a, a promo sort of video today um, that we released on, on social and, and Cody talked about it. You know, he kept, just kept thinking about the 2021 season and getting back and, and sort of exercising those demons. So, so I absolutely agree with you, Rob. I think, you know, those, those tough moments um, sometimes lead to, uh, you know, future success for the team, but they, they help a fan base sort of appreciate uh, when you do, when you do climb that mountain. Sorry, Mer, all yours. Okay, so as you can tell, uh, Craig, we're not really used to doing each other, bouncing off each other, but we'll get used to it one day. Craig, just about the business side of football, you know, the season's over, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, there's a number of factors. How do you sort of look at this 2021 season financially and what it means going down the road? Yeah, you know, th there were some successes for sure. Um, there were some challenges, uh, you know, of course, as well. So, so we saw parts of our business bounce back uh, pretty strongly. Um, so the merchandise is, is one. So especially on game day, um, the fans that came to the stadium came and, and, and bought rider gear. And I don't know if it's been away for two years and they needed some new stuff um, or what it was, but we sold a lot of merchandise this year on, on, on game day, uh, which was great. Concessions were also really, really strong this year. So again, the people that came to the stadium came to, uh, came to, to eat and drink, and, and uh, we, that's reflective in the numbers. So obviously, we, we would have hoped for um, larger crowds. We had some really, really good crowds, um, obviously, to open the season. And, and, and Labor Day, you always, you always expect that. But we did have some, some attendance dr drops uh, off. And, you know, we have to remember we're playing football in the middle of a pandemic. And I think there's lots of factors that are entering into, into that. And so that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, so, so the business has, has recovered in, in, in a meaningful way. Um, obviously, we, we would have hoped to have more fans, but we also understand we are playing football in the middle of a pandemic, and, and that does create challenges. What is generally the difference? I don't know if you've tracked this, but what, is there a percentage difference between, say, what you announce is paid attendance and the number of people who generally go, you know, season ticket holders who have paid for the tickets but wouldn't necessarily go? Is there a an average divergence per game between announced crowd and actual bums and seats? Yeah, it completely varies on on by by a game to game basis. So um, weather plays a big, big factor into that. So obviously the, the the crowd at the last home game was was on the lighter side, and that was primarily driven driven by by um, by weather. And then you get other games like Labor Day where that number is very, very, very small. So. So it ranges. It it can range to as low as two percent. It can range to as high as eighteen percent. Some sometimes. Um, so it really, really is dependent. And it's interesting because we actually did a survey on the on what we call them no shows for the last game, to try to get a sense as to what was driving people's decisions there. And the two biggest reasons was, was weather, obviously number one, which which we kind of anticipated. Uh, the second biggest reason was other commitments, which was interesting um, to us because that would would have been higher than than I would expect in, in the other games. But there was a lot going on that that weekend. And then the other thing that we had, I, I forgot briefly was we sh we shifted that game um, sort of mid mid season to help accommodate the Elks. And it's amazing how many fans plan their schedules around rider rider games. And so as an example, my my parents uh, had, had you know spend the winters in Arizona and they actually adjusted their their uh, their flights so they were going to leave after the, the game which was scheduled was supposed to be scheduled the week before so they actually were out of town because they didn't adjust their their flights um, to accommodate the, the rider game so so it was interesting the other commitments we didn't really dig deep into that but um, that was that was something that um, you know surprised us a little bit but there was a lot going on that weekend and and uh, and and so we have to remember it's a, it's a big commitment as well you know what surprised me, Craig, is I mean, the whole implementation of the vaccine or the proof of vaccination, et cetera. And, and I mean, there's been so many complaints about this and that throughout the pandemic period. And all of a sudden, without a lot of notice, you've got to bring this in and, and, and uh, in conjunction with Evraz or real, um, basically make sure you have the adequate equipment, ad adequate, you know, enough personnel, et cetera. Yet, it all seems to have gone off seamlessly. I haven't heard one word of complaint. Uh, the uh, and people could go into the rider office and pre get pre-approved for entry into a football game. I remember walking by the gate 
for, before the first game where where that policy was in, in effect and, and people were just happy it was moving smoothly. I thought there might be some glitches there, just not through no fault of yours, but just because of timing and circumstances. Has it gone off as effortlessly and as smoothly as it seems to be externally uh, in terms of my perception of it? Yeah, we're we're really happy with how how it's been implemented. Uh, to be honest with you, we were nervous as well. Uh, you know, we were the first large scale event in Saskatchewan to do it, and and it was a big crowd um, that game. Not not our biggest, but it you know it's different when you're doing this in a in a small scale versus trying to get a number of people who inevitably uh, tend to want to come to the game at about or around the same time. So, you know, full credit to our team uh, that was working on the presentation here. Kent Paul, who's our CFO, deserves a lot of credit. Um, but SHA was an incredible help to us. Um, you know, they we reached out to them right away and, and they recognized what we were undertaking here and they really helped us design the process. But some really good ideas came out of that. So the pre-screen was, was definitely a win. I think that first game we had 6,000 people who had gone and, and pre, pre-screened and, and, and checked. So that really speeds things up. Um, we had a tremendous amount of volunteers who helped us uh, at the vaccine checks. So the Regina Thunder, you know, I'd like to sort of commend them as well. They were a group that we reached out to because um, we just needed people. Um, we needed a, a large number of people to be able to, to, to do this effectively. And they, they responded right away. They were they were there and they 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 did every all three games. They they helped us with the vaccine check. So so I think there was a number of really good decisions. But yeah, absolutely, Rob. Like I haven't got one complaint personally on the execution of the uh, the vaccine checks, um, which is which is good. And full credit to our, to, to the team that that designed that. I was at the pre-screening one day looking to see what the lineup was like, and the lineup was almost to the Lawson. But by the time I got to the front of the lineup, most of them were through it. Like so. The people who are doing pre-screening deserve kudos too. It was a fast moving, no one looked unhappy. And I was really impressed with that part of the, the whole process. Yeah, and again, full credit to SHA. They helped us with that in that first game, which was the largest largest crowd for pre-screening. Um, they were there um, helping us do it. And and you know that that's just incredible because obviously they're dealing with the pandemic, but to, to help us execute on that and provide us guidance, you know, I can't I can't um, I can't give them a, a, enough kudos. How about the league and it's dealing with COVID? I've, I'm not going to put words in it, but only one breakout amongst as seen in this whole this whole period. Do they does the, do the league and the players deserve kudos? A little bit of uh, uh, compliments for this. But yeah, no. What I was saying is, was the the protocols are really restrictive, and so full credit to the players and, and coaches. And I know I know it's tough. It's been really tough because that's a long period of time to to live live that way. Uh, and it's interesting because. I get tired of reinforcing that to Jeremy to, to continue to reinforce it to Craig and, and he gets tired of telling Craig, uh, you know, you got, we got to reinforce this. And I know the players are, are, are tired of hearing it from Craig, but they've done a really, really good job. Um, you know, we're not, we're not through yet, but um, we're through the regular season and there's only a few weeks left and, um, and they've done a really, really great job of adhering to the protocols. The protocols themselves were designed to accomplish just this, to keep, Keep everybody safe and keep COVID out of our locker room. And uh, you know, with one exception um, this year, we've we've done a really really good job of that. Do you, Do you anticipate that- a normal life, a normal world in 2022? Are you looking at training camp in May and those kind of things? Yeah, I, I think in terms of the timing, I think I, I'm anticipating it to be uh, normal. Um, but but who knows with COVID what what it's going to mean in terms of protocols, in terms of you know um, proof of vaccination at the stadium. Um, it's it's still too early to kind of kind of sort of determine that or or you know we don't have the crystal ball a, around that but I anticipate the timing to be to be consistent uh, with with a normal season and I anticipate us doing a, a a full 18 game regular season next year starting on time and obviously ending here in in, uh, in Saskatchewan on November 20th. Yeah, what's the 2022 <laughs> season arise? Would you an, in, anticipate that Craig Dickinson and Jeremy O'Day will have contract extensions? They'll be entering under their current agreements. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, those agreements carry through 2022. Given the results of the first two years of their contracts, it would seem to me they would certainly merit extensions. Uh, is that something that you would expect to just get handled as a matter of course over the next few months? Yeah, so they actually are under contract to 2023. Oh, uh, Linda, so, so much not, for that question. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So it's not it's not their last year n- next year. So I imagine next year we'll have those those conversations because obviously 
um, you know, it's not it's not in anybody's best interest to have your your GM and your and your and your coach, uh, you know, that you're obviously very very happy with on the last year of their contract. Two guys sure. didn't know that. Sorry. Uh, I'm just looking. I thought it was three year contract signed in 2019. Which shows what I know. Yeah, yeah. no, and it, it was adjusted. We we extended again in in 2020. So it took a three, same three year contract to 2023. Just, I'm kind of curious, Craig. What, I mean, you look at uh, the situation in Edmonton, and, and I'm not asking you to pass judgment or comment on what's happening there. But when you let go Brendan Tamman and Corey Chamberlain, uh, it was a comparable move in terms of what was you know, uh, severing ties with a GM and a coach. When uh, Edmonton has just done that, when you did it, there was no football operations cap. How much more complicated is that now in in, in Edmonton's situation than it would have been for you in 2015? Yeah, it it is complicated for sure because there's certain certain rules around um, in effect amortizing those costs over a period of time and. They were they were done. Those those rules were put in place so that so that teams are a little bit cautious in terms of um, you know how they how they manage manage their their personnel. So I know um, you know there there used to be long long term contracts given out. Um, nowadays uh, you know teams are are generally a little bit more more cautious with that. You certainly you know like I I mentioned around Jeremy and Craig, you certainly don't want your your GM and your head head coach to be on the, on the last years of, the, of their deal. But on the flip side. You know, you 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 make sure you're being fiscally responsible as, as well. So so yeah, there's some complexities nowadays that, like you said, Rob, we didn't have to deal with um, back when we made that change in, in 2015. But um, you know, they're they're done with in the best interests of, of the of the league. I would suggest. Uh, Rob, do you want to ask him the question about the demographics? I think you have a good. Yeah, Ian Murray, uh, the Eskimos board chair. Apart, I knew I was going to do that. I'm fine for saying ask uh, The Elks board chair uh, said on Monday during his, his press conference after the, the house cleaning at Edmonton that he referred to the demographic. And he basically, what he basically said is the demographic of the Edmonton fan base is pretty much Murray and I. <laughs> you know, in terms of our, our age range, perhaps our hairline. Um, uh, is that a situation you think is, is more widely applicable? Do you look at your own demographic, uh, fan demographic and... and think well it's pretty much the same as i'm seeing on my skype screen right now <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you something it's probably the most talked about topic at, at our office as we as we strategize and as we talk strategy and as we talk marketing and as we talk about the future is our demographics and the need to 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 adjust those now we've got uh, a lot of young fans um and um you know we we work hard at it but we absolutely have a demographic problem. Um, that's 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 apparent and that and that's real. And so, we when we focus around game day, when we focus around marketing, when we focus around communication, we are constantly thinking about about shifting the shifting demographics and trying to shift our, our demographics, attracting a younger crowd, making sure kids uh, we're reaching out to kids, designing programs around um, schools and school visits and getting our players out in the community. Talking to kids. Um, some of the programs we have specifically target areas where we know there's a there's a, a, a an immigrant popul population. So trying to get them to exposed to not only the Rough Riders but Canadian football, and hopefully um, you know create some fandom out of that. So so it is a constant topic of conversation uh, with the riders, and I think across the league it's 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 a topic of conversation, um, and it's a big issue, and it's something that um, you know we work hard at, and we need to. I would say double down on those efforts in the next few years. How challenging is it when you look at it you, with the pandemic? You can't. It isn't as feasible to for players to visit schools, football camps, uh, you know, go to kids' minor football practices, etc. I mean, you you can do things kind of from a distance, but the hands-on, hey, I met Cody Fajardo experiences. That would seem to me to to be a natural impediment right now that only time can repair. Yeah, and and I I agree, and it's it's something that concerns me, um, and it's something that I think impacts things such as attendance. It, it really does. We now will have gone two full years without really being able to to attend events, uh, send our players to events, have those sort of in, interactions that are really really powerful. Like some of my, you know, my rider fandom was driven from interactions with players when when players went out to to the schools in in Foam Lake. Um, I had a, a friend that sort of 
had a, a you know a, a, a friend who played on the team and, and exposed me as a you know as a as a teenager to to some members of of, of our of the, of the riders and and that was really really impactful so i think um being out of the mar- market um if, if you if you phrase it that way without being able to have the sort of the community interaction that has become a staple and was really really important to us i think coming out of the pandemic again it's another area of focus and it's another area where we need to put a ton of effort in that and you know, we're, we're doing that. Uh, we're designing programs right now through our foundation to get into schools, uh, working in the Ministry of Education to talk to kids specifically about mental health coming out of the out of the pandemic and have our players do it. So our players can can get out there and and, um, you know, support the youth of our province, but also have those interactions that I think are really, really critical. I think when I look from the press box and I walk around the stadium, I see a lot of women in the crowd. Are you is that a target? I get, are we allowed to say target for women? I think so, but there's a lot of women that go to football games, and I wonder how much you're doing to attract them and to you know keep building on that. Yeah, you know it's 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 interesting. Our demographics as it relates to women would be absolutely the top in in the league. Like our fan base, when you when you split it in terms of almost every way we look at our fans, from from social followers to to store purchases to the season ticket. Um, base is almost 50 50 um, men and men and women so you know that's that's a little bit unheard of in especially in, in football like you know if you, if you took and took in an NFL team um, I would think you'd be challenged to find any NFL team that was sort of a 50 50 split so so um, you know I think it just speaks to the passion um, you know and 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 the brand in the province it's something that um, you know the entire province tends to get behind and 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 um, you know, it has been a focus for sure um, to, to focus in, you know, in on in our on our female fans and, and it's working. Um, and, and I agree with you, Murray, when I walk around the stadium, it is it is younger um, for sure, especially when you get to that field country area. That, that's a youthful, <laughs> youthful crowd. Um, and and, you know, the the the, the split in terms of uh, male, male, female is really good. A lot of professional sports teams would would kill for the for that that split that we have here. I what think do you think turns that, Craig? Like, I, I used to go to games with my mom. Like, my mom and I had mom and I had season tickets from '76 through forever, and and I remember it was it was really a novelty for my mom to be a you know to to for there to be a female football fan as enthusiastic as she was. And I remember looking around the stands and and just it was it was it seemed like it was 90% males sitting or sitting around us. I was mom was really an anomaly in terms of uh, being a Ryder fan. Uh, what changed over time? Because I don't even think of a gender a differentiation anymore. A rider fan's a rider fan. You don't really, there's no novelty for there being a female fan. Whereas once upon a time, mom was the only female on a Dash Tours bus going from Regina to Calgary, Winnipeg or Edmonton, or one of the few. Yeah, you know, you know, it's, it's hard to pinpoint one, one thing. You know, I think the focus on the fan um, that um, the club did years ago uh, re- really helped. Um, for sure, I think the focus on merchandising has has really helped. Um, you know, I think I think uh, appealing to a, a, a female fan and, and, and the moms, um, you know, in terms of um, you know from from a, a merchandise perspective, is important. I think trying to make games an event is is important as well because you know it's really no different than a concert. When you go to a concert, um, you know, it's generally going to be um, you know equal equal men and female because it's largely an event so i think when we focus in on what we're doing on game day um, some of the theme days we're doing obviously labor day in particular is, is trying to make it an event um, so it's it's about football but it's about more than football it's about a gathering place and it's about um uh, you know something that as a province we do and we we unite behind so sometimes it's it's, it's not even about the game and i think that's what we're really learning about a younger fan it's not necessarily about the game you hope they come there and they have a good time and they learn to love the game but it's about getting them there for the event and the activity and that's why pill country and the design of the stadium around pill country has been such a winner because there's a lot of you know i've walked around there during game days and i would say there's a good portion of those fans who may not know what the score is and some of them may not even know who we're playing uh, but they're having a good time, and it's the place to be. And you hope that uh, with with time, and and that they they tend to uh, to grow up loving loving the game. But in the meantime, they they love the atmosphere of the stadium. They love being around their their friends. They love the energy of the crowd, and they love being part of it, something bigger than themselves. 
I think Craig, as I, my daughters grew up going to games with me and they felt comfortable. And as they got older, they were teenagers, they would go as a group and they always felt comfortable and safe at Mosaic Stadium. And I think that's a big part of this. Maybe the change is women can go there as a group and feel, you know, as I said, comfortable and safe. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's a really good point, Murray. Um, you know, we had a really big focus on security and obviously the stadium design helps with that. And it was interesting. So that, you know, we had a, we had somebody make their way into the field the last game. That was the first time in seven years that that's happened. Um, so, you know, that, that speaks to, you know, some of the security uh, changes that, that we made. Um, and But I agree. You know, you, you want to make sure you, you feel safe. We're not without issues. We still have some issues and we continue to work on those and we continue to to, to want to create a, a safe environment there because I think that's a, a huge part of it. When you feel safe and you feel comfortable and you have a good time, you're going to want to come back. How big is the Truth and Reconciliation program or initiative that you've undertaken uh, become within the organization? It, it's huge. We have a, we have a task force um, that meets uh, every, every couple of weeks. Uh, Cindy Fuchs, who's our executive director of the foundation, is, is, is leading it. We've got um, some Indigenous leaders in the province um, who sit on the task force and help to, to guide us and and um, and um, and provide some counseling to us in terms of uh, areas of focus. We've got specific um, specific um, um, uh, of the Truth and Reconciliation Act, uh, specific calls to action that we're actually focusing in on. And so one of those calls to action was to enable, um, you know, Indigenous youth to participate in sports. I don't know the exact, I forget the exact number, but it's it's one of the calls to action that we're focusing on. And so, so that's been an area of focus. And, and the, the Northern South Football League in particular has been an area where our foundation has um, donated money to, to uh, enhance that program and, and keep that program alive and to grow that program. In the last game we were here, we had 147 um, um, players and coaches and, and families from that Northern South Football League who had the vast majority of them had never been um, to, to a game in, 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 in Mosaic Stadium and uh, many of them hadn't ever been to, to Regina. And um, so, so that was, that was a meaningful um, day, day for them. We had a breakfast with them um, following that and, and Mason Fine who has indigenous heritage uh, spoke to that group um, via Zoom. Um, and uh, we had Neil Hughes uh, there as well. And I know, um, um, just I was there and, and, and that meant a lot to the players. And so so it's things like that, you know, actually providing a bit of focus for the club um, because, you know, you want to you want to uh, make make meaningful impact and in, in the areas that um, you're, you're, it's most logical for you to, to impact. And so so that's been uh, that's been a huge focus of the club and it, it will continue to be. How about this, Craig? What's Sunday going to be like for you? Are you going to be like a kid at Christmas hopping out of bed early in the morning, running down the stadium? Open the doors to see your full place, or what it'll be like for you. Well, I'll, I'll be I'll be part excited for exactly that um, because playoff games are are exciting, um, and home playoff games like like we talked about earlier don't come around um, you know all all that all that often, um, and so when they do, you you appreciate them. But I will be a bundle of nerves um, for sure. And I send a note uh, to Jeremy after I forget which of the last games, one of the last games, which was again, another close game. And I just sort of said, you know, Jeremy, my heart can't take this. And he, he sort of said, yeah, no, I, I, I hear you because it seems like every game we're in this year is, is, is close. And, you know, it's a sign of a good team when you find a way to, at the end to win those games, but we're not, we're not certainly not, uh, not blowing people out. I don't think this, I think it's actually coach Dickinson who said it, we're not really built. Um, you know, that's just really not the identity of the style of, of, of this football team. Uh, it's kind of grind it out and, and find a way to win at the end. Um, you know, we've had really close games to Calgary. Anticipate it's going to be another close game. Um, so I will I'll be a bundle of nerves, as I usually am on game day, and it'll be probably just amplified uh, because it's a playoff game. And, uh, you know, you either go on to Winnipeg or your, or your season's unfortunately done. I just, uh, we're basically done. I know you'll be uh, pleased to hear that, Craig. Thanks for all your time. I, just, I thought I would extend to you the invitation if there's anything you'd like to say to the fans or or anyone, uh, or, or us, <laughs> uh, anything you'd like to, uh, to, uh, talk about that we haven't raised that you think is pertinent and relevant? Yeah, no, I just, you know, absolutely appreciate, um, the time you guys you know, have given to me today. And, and I always enjoy these, these chats and, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to, uh, to seeing our fans at, at the stadium. I would, I would encourage fans to, 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 um, you know, 
get their tickets and, and come come see the West West Semi. I think it's going to be a, a great game. Um, fans make a big difference. You, you, you hear it time and time again. Then the noise is impactful, and uh, they give us a competitive advantage. So uh, get your tickets to the West Semi. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful Sunday uh, day uh, for football. Uh, we don't get too many plus days in November 28th, um, and, I, and I can hardly wait. Well, it's amazing. I do the halftime segment every home game on CKRM, and we're kind of sequestered in the press box, and we, we kind of get a feel for what the vibe is. But then I go into the uh, – I generally get to the CKRM booth right before halftime, and it seems a lot of times this year there's been some drama in the final few seconds. And when I walk into the CKRM booth and I hear you know, there's no there's no window, you just hear it. And even if it's 25,000 people as opposed to 33,000, it generally – it just hits me like a hammer just how much noise the fans are making. And that's the regular season before halftime, but it's a really robust crowd. Yeah, and there's there's nothing like the energy of a of a rider game, um, pre-game, um, after a big play. Um, and it's amplified on on, on playoff games. It, it really is. I remember that West Semi uh, being there for the bring them out, and it was absolutely deafening in that, in that, in that building. And uh, players feed off that, obviously. Um, and, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty electric atmosphere on, on, on Sunday. Great. I have to read our little uh, uh, thing at the end. I think they call it an outro in the broadcasting biz. Uh, you, now you know why we didn't go into broadcasting. Um, if, you enjoy the prod- bleh, if you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review and a five-star rating. It helps us grow the podcast. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to send us a question, you can email me, Rob, at rvanstoneofpostmedia.com, and we'll read it on the show. You can follow me, Rob, on Twitter at, at Rob Vanstone or Murray uh, at Murray LP. Craig, where should people follow, go on social media to uh, pay attention to your platforms? You in the large, <laughs> you in the larger sense, as opposed to, as opposed uh, as, as far as the football team is concerned. Riderville.com is your is your best best bet, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. and And I I tend to stay off social media as much as I I can, but uh, the odd time I'll I'll check it out check it out what you guys are what you guys are saying. Is there a Craig Reynolds burner account that we don't know about that perhaps we should no. follow? No, and they're probably who knows. No, there's not there's not <laughs> an officially there's not an officially sanctioned uh, Craig Reynolds burner account uh, for uh, that I know of. So <laughs> no, I. Uh, I have a social media rule that I've got a 24-hour rule as a, in the li- in the build-up to the game and subsequent to the game. 24 hours before the game, 24 hours after the game. I I avoid all social media, and then after that, you kind of uh, get back into it. You are very, very wise and very, very uh, thoughtful to spend this past hour with us, Craig. Thank you so much for doing this. No, I appreciate you guys. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Thanks for Rob Vanstone. That's Craig Reynolds, and we will do this again uh, next week. Take care and uh, have a great day.